Welcome back, everyone. We're here starting back with the Deuteronomistic history, picking up where we left off with the um, rise of David and what is sometimes called the Golden Age of the reigns of David and his son Solomon. I put the question mark Golden Age because, on the one hand, these kings will always be looked upon as being great and legendary kings, and some types, in some cases, archetypes of what a great king is like. But on other hands, they're their lives are very dramatic, very traumatic, and uh, show a great deal of tragedy as well as a promise. And as we'll see, uh, the complication is met with also with promise. Here you have David. He's presented as very a very successful king, but a very flawed person at home. Um, he's a complicated figure. Yes, he's devoted to God, and so when he promises God, he wants to build a, a temple. God promises to favor his dynasty uh, forever. Um, and you see this in 2 Samuel 7. But immediately after that, though, David is seen to be a very erratic and unjust king. Uh, he takes the, um, the wife of Uriah, one of his top generals, takes the wife Bathsheba from him. And then uh, when one of his children, uh, when one of his sons rapes his daughter, um, and Absalom kills rapist, David seeks after Absalom and acts quite erratically. In the long run, Absalom will, after receiving uh, a type of pardon, will end up trying to take over the kingdom from David. So there are a number of intrigues and family uh, problems that, f that fall upon David in this whole mess. And this continues with his son Solomon. Solomon, whom he has through Bathsheba, uh, is successful in building the temple, but he has many flaws. The Deuteronomistic history will point to the fact that Solomon had many foreign wives, and this will lead him to end up uh, committing events of idolatry or permitting idolatry within the temple or within the palace. And the, the northern tradition and the anti-idolatrous tradition of the Deuteronomistic history will also have an anti-foreign an anti-female element. Foreign wives are always the negative element in the Deuteronomistic history. Um, and so that ends up being the major culprit and the major reason for the destruction of, or sorry, the secession of the North in the Deuteronomistic history. But in reality, what probably caused it and what the Deuteronomistic history also points to is, although in a much more subtle way, is that Solomon had conscripted a number of northerners to build the temple. He hadn't pulled it from his own, uh, his own tribesmen in Judah. He had pulled it from the north. And these northerners were tired of having to give up a year of their lives to work on the temple, away from their families, away from their crops. And that was essentially the reason why they left. The north will secede following Solomon's death after his son Rehoboam declares that he will be even harsher to the north than his father was. Not exactly the best diplomat. The northern kingdom had a significant number of prophets who now rise up um, after the new king Jeroboam takes over. Um, the new king Jeroboam sets up a new palace, two new temples, and his, his secession was seen as appropriate and divinely ordered. However, his setting up of new temples was seen as idolatrous and was condemned. Now, it's also worthwhile to keep in mind that this student in mystic tradition, a lot of it was written from the South a century later. And so this material has a specific bias, uh, just as people from Arkansas might attack or have a negative view of people in Texas in their history. Um, the same might be said of people in the South having a negative view of Northerners in Israel. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha are definitely going to rise up at this time, and again, you're going to have stories about foreign female influence uh, leading to idolatry, in particular with the character Jezebel uh, in the stories of Elijah. You have uh, being a prophet not being very easy, as, as, as seen in 1 Kings 22 with the story of Micaiah, having to come in and prophesy and getting into trouble and even thrown in prison for doing that. The North is successful economically. It's actually the better place to be in terms of a strong, stable economy than in the South. But 
Whereas the South has political stability and small economy, the North has a great economy but terrible political instability. And this will end up uh, leading to the greatest devastation uh, coming from Assyria, which hits the North first and, uh, and attacks it and destroys it. Um, for the most part, the Deuteronomistic history will say this is because of breaking the covenant and because of idolatry. Um, and that's fair. It's also fair to note Assyria had wiped out pretty much everyone around them as well. And the only thing that keeps them from attacking and destroying Jerusalem uh, is the fact that they had a civil war implode um, right at the time that they would have been crushing Jerusalem and the, uh, the attacking general needed to go back to, uh, to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, to be able to claim um, the leadership. So that's basically why Jerusalem ended up surviving. Now, years later, uh, under Assyria, Assyria power will wane, and you'll have Josiah come to the fore. Josiah will be seen as the only good king after David. So if there was a golden age before, uh, Josiah is now the redeemed platinum age in the eyes of the authors. That tells you a little bit about either how they viewed Josiah or the fact that maybe they were writing at his time. Um, Josiah institutes religious reforms, uh, in particular most told in 2 Kings 22, and what's interesting about those is that they resemble a lot of the statues that are seen in Deuteronomy 6 to 26. So was that the book that Josiah found in the temple? Um, was Deuteronomy 6 to 26 written and then comprised in order to uh, basically rationalize Josiah's politically uh, institutionalized reform. There are different ways of looking at this. One thing's for certain, those traditions are definitely tied together and refer literarily from one to the other. Josiah had been raised by a high priest after attaining the throne, and, um, and that religious influence appears to be what might have triggered him uh, in this reform. Because Assyria was on its decline, Josiah will have the opportunity when he comes of age to rule and to institute these reforms in a way that kings before him could not have done. Now, this religion reform, without a doubt, offered national stability and it unified cultural identity. Um, in particular, it's going to require everyone to come to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, the Passover and to recall their Exodus identity, their Exodus narrative, and their cultural identity. So that unifies everyone around Josiah, but it also creates this narrative of an anti-foreigner perspective. Uh, it's the same concept that we see in Joshua and a lot of the sentiments that we saw in the Deuteronomistic history. There's this view that there are Israelites, there are the circumcised that are the ones who are in this land rightly, and then there are foreigners who will tempt them to idolatry and end up leading to their destruction. And in particular, foreign women are the greatest threat. So when we look at what we see in the Deuteronomistic history, a lot of it aligns in terms of ideology and terminology with Josiah's religious and political reforms. Um, at the very least, whatever the connections or impulses might have been, there are connections that run through all of these that have to be factored in to the interpretation. So what happened to Judah? Josiah's reform was significant, but it was not enough. The South will end up falling. Um, the, the, the literature of the Deuteronomistic history will point to terrible kings like Manasseh and others who led um, Jerusalem and Judah to commit idolatry. And, uh, and even in the temple itself. The sedition was seen as so terrible that God has to basically bring Babylon in as something like a hitman to punish Judah and to take its people into exile. Um, and one of the best lines, and this is said both of the north and of the south, uh, in terms of their idolatry, they pursued emptiness and emptiness consumed them. And that is the view of idolatry, uh, theologically speaking, from the Deuteronomistic historian. When you pursue that empty power, that empty power will consume you. 
So was there idolatry in Israel? Well, the evidence supports the fact that 